I've got a presentation with some pictures to entertain you and to give you a better insight into what we do, but I, I thought I might start by just saying to you that the job of the Garvin and places like this is to um, provide a home and a, uh, a place for gifted individuals uh, to, to uh, explore the unknown. Uh, our job is to invent the future, to change the future, and, and that's really why society invests in, in places like this, and to some extent the universities. I mean, the universities have two functions, uh, to educate the next generation in, um, in uh, professional careers of all sorts, but also to gather new knowledge. And as humans, and uh, you know, probably the most important thing we can do, um, and do do, is to, to generate knowledge that then translates back into improved uh, quality of life for our citizens. And uh, looking around the room, some of you are as old as I am, I think. Uh, you might remember the 50s and 60s, etc. And, and our grandparents who might have emigrated, uh, as mine did, uh, 50 years earlier from the United Kingdom and Ireland. And it reflect on, on the, the, the differences that, that we, the quality of life that we enjoy and our kids enjoy compared to, to their life and their struggles. You know, ever since uh, probably the Enlightenment uh, uh, with the foundation of the Royal Society and the French Academy, but through the Industrial Revolution, humans have been on a journey to, to greater knowledge and that, that greater knowledge is translated into improved quality of life in all dimensions. I think it's really important to stand back and say what does science give us, what does science and technology deliver. And through uh, the increase in industrial production efficiency, uh, all the way through to current concerns about robotics and artificial intelligence, we humans have been able to improve the efficiency and quality of production, which means that we can live better and better lives. The quality of our food is better, our transport. Our kids finish university in France rather than, you know, in, uh, in Kensington. So uh, the world has changed really for the better, despite the fact that there's still a lot of problems. And I don't know who it was. Um, Maybe it was Warren Buffett who said that the future um, is already with us, it's just not evenly distributed. And that's still a, still a uh, challenge for us as a just society. But um, that's our job. Uh, and, and, and the places like this attract really interesting people who are less concerned about how much they're paid. I mean, I have to tell you that one of my constant concerns is that we pay our people so poorly because they're not you know, who wants a consultant biochemist? It's not the same as when you need a dentist when you've got a toothache. It's, um, so we, I think we almost are at risk of um, exploiting the, the higher aspirations of the people who work in uh, places like the Garvin, who do it because they love the, the challenge of uh, exp trying to understand the unknown. They really stand as a bit romantic, a bit poetic, but on the edge of darkness, trying to figure out What's that? What's going on? What's what's going on with Parkinson's disease, or, or you know, neuropsychiatric disease in the, ki in the kids? What what is it? And and, and the clues kind of are, uh, are sort of vague. And you, you know, it's easy enough to to propose a project when you're building a bridge. You can put a Gantt chart down, and all the engineering is pretty much worked out. But when you try to understand human biology, it's a different matter. And you need very gifted people who are driven to do that, and also driven of a sense of community because the, the real satisfaction is uh, to make life better for people. And, and on that score, I, I think um, um, medical research has done an extraordinary job over the last century or so. The survival rates from cancer are, are, are excellent now, they're not, not always, but, um, but they're getting better and I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. Um, you know, even uh, the greatest Australian of all, I think, was Howard Florey. Now we can debate Bradman and Florey, but you know, the sort of <laughs> <laughs> that Florey was the one that has saved more lives than uh, than anybody else on this planet, uh, because he went to Oxford as an Australian in uh, just prior to World War II and worked out how to produce penicillin in bulk. And most of the deaths you may um, may recall uh, in World War One were due to not to bullets but to infections as a result of wounds. But that completely changed in World War Two, and you know, the, just the simple vaccinations and antibiotics, um, and now advanced surgeries, heart disease, uh, stents, uh, you know, better treatments for cancer, 
the world has changed enormously and our lifespan has gone up and up and up so they're now pushing into the 80s and it'll keep going up. And the issue now for us is not just to extend lifespan but also the years of quality life, you know, happy, healthy life. Uh, and we've got a way to go. But I, I think it's been an extraordinarily successful investment and I, I also would say to you, that, as I do to our political leaders regularly, that uh, health is not a cost. Health is the biggest and most important industry in the world because as our economy becomes more prosperous uh, because of knowledge and application of knowledge in other domains, we spend our surplus prosperity on lifestyle and health. And in the end, as we all discover at some point in time, uh, health takes priority over everything else. So I really think that the next revolution in our society is upon us, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment, and that over the next 20 or 30 years, we'll see a complete transformation of the healthcare system led by places like the Garvin. Uh, they'll change it basically from the art of crisis management to the science of health maintenance. Uh, and this picture is, uh, embodies what we're trying to achieve. So that uh, our kids or their kids are going to enjoy a future where it's unlikely they're going to be uh, surprised by disease, uh, but rather that they will live much more active and fulfilling lives because their health has been maintained from a knowledge base that we, we just haven't had uh, up until this point in time. And that's coming through human genomics. Now, so this is a bit, um, this is just general background, but um, we do seek to understand human biology. It's the most fascinating thing of all. Uh, in fact, places like Garvin have two roles in society. The first one's well understood, the second one's not. The first is to contribute to the canon of knowledge. I mean, there's, there's great institutes around the world, uh, and, and, and we're one of them. But we don't do it alone, and uh, so what's, what we understand about uh, human biology and medicine is, is a compendium of all the places like this. But our second job, uh, and more importantly for Australia, is that we are the portal to that world of knowledge. And so when an advance is made in understanding or treating prostate cancer in New York, we know about it the next day and we're talking to our clinical colleagues across the road about introducing that into the clinic. And that's why people come to St Vincent's because they expect that they will get not only the best care because of the tradition of the Sisters of Charity, but also the best quality of care because of the, uh, the research-informed um, uh, treatment that people get. So we, we focus on most of the common diseases affecting our community, uh, cancer, neurological disorders, both in the young and old. Autoimmunity um, is a huge um, area, probably responsible for at least half of all human disease. We're talking about not just type 1 diabetes and multiple sclerosis, but arthritis. And as you'll see, um, uh, I'll talk about briefly, it's uh, providing a route to the actual curing of cancer. Um, and we have very advanced facilities. Uh, just upstairs in level seven above us, about 40, 50 metres away, is the, one of the world's largest genome sequencing facilities. Uh, we've already sequenced 15,000 whole genomes for, for research and for clinical treatment. Mm -hmm. and in fact, uh, we were not only one of the first three centres in the world to get the equipment for the sequenced genomes for a base cost of $1,000 US, but uh, we're one of the first well, we are the first centre outside North America that's clinically accredited to, to do genome analysis for, for clinical treatment. So we have a lot of uh, equipment and, and look, our mission is to make significant contributions to medical research uh, that change the direction of science. We've still got a long way to go to understand what we really are, what's under the hood, particularly up here, uh, but we're making a lot of progress. And, I used to think that the 20th century was the second half belonged to biology from the double helix onwards. But I think I was wrong, that was just the foothills. This, this is the century of biology and medicine. The technology is now just incredible. Fastest revolution in history, faster than the computer revolution. And so this century we'll start to understand who we really are and where we, where we come from. So. Um, that's our objective, so I won't bore you with reading this out, but you know, great science. We need to be sustainable, and that's partly why uh, we love it when people from the community are interested in what we do and come along to hear about it and potentially help us be sustainable. And more than sustainable, to have the 
st stability and resources to attack the future bravely. The most, one of the, I'm going a bit off piste as they say here, but one of our handicaps is that the peer review system for public funding is um, by definition and by, by uh, evidence is a regression to the mean that often if you have really gifted individuals they're ahead of the curve and the, the orthodox view is, uh, well, they believe it all. And uh, you know, our responsibility to earn public support here is to be great and, and attract really great individuals into a hothouse environment where they bounce off each other as we do but to be able to say, look, we know she's fantastic and we want to be able to support her to do that because the system hasn't caught up with uh, her ideas yet. And that's really important that, uh, you know, these additional resources that we, we get from the community allow us not only to run this place efficiently and have good infrastructure, as Carol said, but also to empower gifted people in a way that the conventional system doesn't. In fact, there's just been a book written in the United Kingdom about this, showing that uh, in the 20th century, nearly all of the transformative advances that, that uh, drove the 20th century actually came outside the conventional systems from people who were just so gifted that nobody else believed them, uh, you know, because they were truly um, revolutionary. We want to have health impact and we want to innovate, of course, and that's part of our sustainable culture is to actually translate what we do into, uh, you know, um, goods and services that are of the community, but in so doing, if we do it um, uh, in a business-like way, then we might be able to generate some resources to continue our work. So as I said, we've got the most advanced sequencing facility in the Southern Hemisphere, um, and the fourth largest in the world. The, we've, we, we've got the most fantastic group of p uh, people here. Uh, Carol showed their photographs, but you know, uh, these are really, truly gifted people. Uh, Chris Goodnow, for example, Deputy Director, is, uh, I call him Triple Crown. He's not only a fellow of the Australian Academy of Science, he's a fellow of the Royal Society of England. That's the one, Newton and Darwin, etc. And it's just been inducted into the National Academy of Sciences in the United States. It's very rare for any Australian to be inducted into those uh, two foreign academies. Sue Clark has just been given the Ramachotti Medal. Um, uh, David Thomas, you'll see a photograph of him again in a moment. And as I said, we've uh, well, we've launched the first um, enterprise outside North America that's uh, clinically accredited for genomic um, analysis. So when I came here six years ago, returning back to my roots here in Sydney, uh, from the wilderness <laughs> in Queensland, actually, I, no, it was wonderful. I, I was uh, uh, very fortunate to be very closely involved with Premier Peter Beattie and the uh, the creation of the smart state and, and the turning of Brisbane from a rather hokey capital into a, uh, you know, an R&D powerhouse and it was just wonderful. It was nice living there but um, couldn't resist the chance to come back here to the Garvin to invent the future in another way. And because I was convinced that the technologies that I'd learned as a postdoctoral fellow and beyond about gene analysis were, were just blossoming to the point where we can actually look under the hood at all of our individual idiosyncrasies and every one of us is different uh, we kind of know that but it's never been possible to take this into account in, in medicine because we didn't know how to measure those differences we could look at somebody and say well you're different to me but that you know, only gets you so far so the genomic revolution uh, it really occurred in the 1990s uh, and by 2001 the human genome had been sequenced and it cost 3,000 million US dollars to do that, $3 billion. It was a space project, it was equivalent to the Apollo space program, and mainly funded by the American government, but also the Wellcome Trust in England and, and national governments around the world, to actually sequence the human genome for the first time, which was a, a, an amazing effort. Are we talking about six billion bits of information uh, in these 23 uh, pairs of chromosomes that we inherit from mum and dad, one each, uh, there's about two metres of DNA in every one of your cells. There's about a hundred cells in a pinhead. Mm -hmm. you know, two metres. Unbelievable. You know, and, and that's got all of the instructions required to take uh, program human development from the point of fertilisation at conception to something that walks and talks. It's, it's, it's incredible. It's the most important sophisticated software suite in the world. So to be able to sequence it um, at scale has just been an incredible uh, achievement. With the front cover of Time magazine, uh, 
announcements on both sides of the Atlantic by President Clinton and Prime Minister Blair at the time. You know, imagine the species that gets to a point of technological sophistication. I mean, we do make progress. It's not just pie in the sky. To be able to read its own genetic material, incredible. I mean, it's, it's almost mind-boggling, but we're now used to it because we do it every day, you know, hundreds every week across the road there. So um, these are the 23 pairs of chromosomes that would look like down under a microscope. Um, so this is a, a lady because she's got two X chromosomes down in the bottom right, whereas uh, us blokes have only got one of those X chromosomes, and we've got a little thing called the Y, which is quite small, which is source of much mirth among our female scientists. <laughs> and, and you, you might be, this is true, uh, interested to know that uh, the X chromosomes, and you've got two of them, the girls, uh, enrich for uh, genes involved in um, uh, brain function. So <laughs> that's why you're smarter I'm than me. <laughs> <laughs> I told my sons recently, <laughs> they're just at that age, you know, of uh, 18, 20, I said, uh, you know, just keep away from these creatures for as long as you can. <laughs> but when you do get sucked in, try and find somebody like your mother because she's got great generosity and great, um, great integrity, you know. <laughs> but I'm, I'm trying to warn them without being put them off too much. <clears throat> so um, I want to tell you a couple of stories now because uh, with the, the ability to sequence human genomes, I could have shown you graphs about faster than Moore's law, etc. But from the three billion dollars in 2001, in 2014, when these guys walked in from San Diego to talk to me and John Schubert, our chair, and, and John, our chair, you mentioned Jeff Dixon, John Schubert, uh, the chair of the board, uh, was chair of the Commonwealth Bank for years on the board of BHP for. Uh, 16 years and so, chairman of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, wonderful man. So these guys came to see us and I said, do you want to be one of the first five centres in the world to get this kit to sequence a genome for $1,000? Down from three billion, $1,000. And we were sworn to secrecy, he asked us the question, because there's only one answer to that question. <laughs> so, and I was very lucky, I said, Perhaps a story I could tell you if you're interested, but um, that the Kinghorn Foundation, uh, within 48 hours, provided the $10 million we needed to buy that equipment. And we were actually the first organisation in the world to order that equipment. It was amazing. Now, with that equipment, we can sequence thousands of genomes, so we can actually ask what's different about you and me in all sorts of contexts. But the, where we applied ourselves in the first place was to the serious problem of um, genetic disorders, such as these kids here. Now, you, you, you'd be surprised, I think, to hear that about 2% of all the babies born in our society, in fact, of any country, have severe uh, developmental and or intellectual disabilities. 2%. And between 8 and 10% of all of us are going to end up in hospital at some point in our life because of a simple genetic defect. And I'll talk, perhaps give you one or two examples of that that you can relate to. But, you know, you can imagine a situation where, you know, there's nothing more joyous than the birth of a baby and then the baby is disabled. Now, for about 15-20% of those cases, they can be diagnosed as due to things like cystic fibrosis or whatever. In fact, it turns out, and probably one or two of you are as well, I'm a carrier for cystic fibrosis. I didn't know until I had my genome sequence. Because uh, even though these genetic disorders are uh, con common, you've got to cop two, two bad genes before you get the disease. So I've got one good one, one bad one, so I'm okay. But I, I, I hope you, none of you have been in this situation, but it's not hard to put yourself in the situation of a parent who's got a, a child who's disabled. And in most cases, their disabilities were impossible to diagnose because there was something wrong genetically, but nobody knew what. There's 20,000 conventional protein coding genes and the damage could have been any one of them, uh, often uh, in strange ways. So being able to sequence the genomes of these kids and try, try to understand what's wrong with them has been transformative. I'm just going to tell you two stories. One actually done by an Australian at the Texas Medical Centre where I used to work, uh, Richard Gibbs, country boy from Colac, Victoria, and he did this. So uh, here's the, the Beery twins, it's up on the web, uh, and you can see they're not in good shape. 
um, and if you can read, twins suffered seizures, balance coordination problem, vomiting, misdevelopmental milestones, kept getting worse, nobody could give us answers. Uh, Alex could walk and move around in the morning, but by 11 o'clock she couldn't walk, sit up or swallow food, her eyes would roll around, hands would tremor, etc., and getting worse. So, actually, this, um, there's a great book out there called The Patient Will See You Now. Uh, you go online, it's a good title. And one of the chapters in that book uh, by Eric Topol, he's a cardiologist from, from San Diego, is about how parents uh, often know more about the conditions affecting them or their kids than the treating physicians do because they're intelligent people and they've got the time to go and research. And in this case, the mum figured it out, at least half figured it out, because the, the symptoms were similar to a disease called, or a genetic problem called um, Sagawa's dystonia, I don't know what it's called. And uh, which is due to a defect in a neurotransmitter in the brain, so the brain's not working properly. And it can be uh, alleviated by dietary supplementation. So she convinced the doc to give the boy, I think it was, the dietary supplementation. And he sort of got better, but not completely better. But she was on the right track. So these were very proactive parents. I mean, because, they, and these, these kids, it was like a double um, problem for them because they both had the same condition or a very similar condition. So, um, well, it's not, uh, sorry, it's normally um, a little bit more uh, dynamic than this, but um, basically uh, Richard Gibbs, the last author in the paper, sequenced them, and if the abstract could be seen, uh, what they say, find is that these kids um, suffered a, uh, a loss of a, an enzyme which was required for the production of two neurotransmitters in the brain, not just dopamine, dopamine and serotonin, you might have heard of these things. And so when they realised that, they were able to supplement the diet to get around the metabolic defect. And that's the kids on the left and that's, the, that's them on the right now. So completely transformed their lives. Yeah, it's, um, and they've just graduated college and they're running marathons, etc. So, so in some of these cases, there's really transformative outcomes. In most cases, uh, damage is done. And, but at least if you understand the source of the problem, you're on the first track to being able to work out how to how to alleviate or, or reverse it. And the parents, of course, are just desperate to find out what's wrong, wrong with their kids. And it saves an awful lot of money for the healthcare system because it saves a lot of what we call the di diagnostic odyssey because she, the docs can't send people home. They can't just say sorry. So they do a lot of tests that they know are uh, unlikely to be informative, but they do it because they can't do anything else. So there are savings for the healthcare system, but also wonderful outcomes for the families, including confidence to have more kids once they know what's wrong. It's easy enough to avoid the problem again. So uh, I mentioned that we've got the, uh, the Kinghorn um, Centre for Clinical Genomics uh, across the way there. We've done 16,000 now. We've got a lot of people involved in, in terms of pulling this all together, including the software that's required for it. I just want to tell you the story now about the second. This is our story. This is a little boy called Alan who was uh, at the, that's him in real life, uh, 12 months ago or so at the Children's Hospital at Randwick and he's dying. Uh, he's dying from internal bleeding. Uh, this is him at the time with his mum, a poor little mite, and she would stay with him in intensive care. He was routinely brought back into intensive care because he was bleeding to death internally. He had no platelets in his blood, which is what you need for clotting. And uh, it's, it's like being on rat poison. But nobody knew why or what to do about it, except that he was dying. Uh, so uh, Chris Goodnow has been mentioned a couple of times, the deputy director um, and colleagues uh, sequenced his genome and discovered that he was missing or he had damaged copies of a gene involved in, in immunological function. So this was a strange outcome of autoimmunity. Now we still don't know why he's got no platelets because of this mutation, but Knowing what it was, Chris was able to search the literature and found another drug called a Batacept, a drug called a Batacept, which had been developed for transplantation therapy, but was a, targeted the same pathway as a, his problem. So we got emergency ethical approval to put the boy on the drug because it hadn't been safety tested in adults. And uh, four weeks later, and I'm not exaggerating, he, he leaves hospital. And that was... Uh, 
That's him. Uh, he's back at school. He's not completely out of the woods, but he's he's in pretty good shape. That's his mum and dad there. Lovely uh, uh, Turkish Australians. Uh, and in fact, the dad on the right there, um, Tansel, is uh, an artificial intelligence expert. And he's quit his job at the bank to come and work for us and help uh, change the life for other kids as well. So, which is lovely, lovely little circularity. To do this, we've um, established a clinical genomics unit at the, uh, the St Vincent's Hospital so that clinicians can refer patients in and get the right advice about these sorts of testing. But this is where it's going to go, um, is that into the, into the whole of life health management, and it's going to do it in, I'll give you a couple of examples, but as I said, every one of us is different and every one of us has different risks out there. Yeah, you remember a few weeks ago, uh, Dean Mercer, the Iron Man, dropped dead on the way back from the gym, mm -hmm. slammed into a fence and just dropped dead. And he almost certainly had a cardiac mutation called Long QT syndrome, which is the cause of cardiac arrest. In fact, 30% of all sudden deaths in Australia uh, are due to cardiac arrests that are diagnosable by genome sequencing. Don't worry. Just put a, put a, a pacemaker in and you'll be fine. And your kids won't be... <laughs> could be you, it could be anybody. Your kids won't be crying at the gravesite when you're 42 years old. And, uh, you know. So there's, there's a lot of upside to this because once you get under the hood, you can see what the issues are. So um, the two examples I want to mention are the first in cancer genomics. And we were one of the pioneers of this here. And we did pancreatic cancer mainly. Uh, a few years ago, when the sequencing costs got low enough, we uh, all around the world, people said, well, let's find out what's really going on in cancer. You know, and so we started to sequence cancers, and, and Garvin sequenced hundreds of pancreatic cancers, and other people did colon cancer or liver cancer, whatever. And what we uh, discovered was that, in this, in this colour coding scheme here, that this cancer is just cancer. You know, in a sense, there's no such thing as breast cancer or colon cancer, it's just cancer just happens to be in the colon or the liver or whatever. And that the spectrum of mutations in our DNA that cause the cancer are similar in different tissues, although the proportion is different. So without going through this in detail, um, if you look at HER2, which is a particular gene that occupies 15 or 20, causes about 15 to 20 percent of breast cancers, it, it causes 3% uh, of pancreatic cancers and about 8% of colon cancers, etc. So there's a drug available to treat HER2, it's been treated for breast cancer, it's quite effective, and we, now we can reuse it or use it in the subset of cases of people who've got pancreatic cancer or colon cancer. But you've got to sequence the cancer first because you're not going to give an expensive drug like this to all of the colon cancer patients and the off chance that you know, 8 in 100 are going to respond. So this is changing dynamics in the cancer treatment clinics because it's no longer good enough just to send the cancer biopsy to the pathologist, look down the microscope. You, you need to send it to the genome center to work out what, what's the mutation that's driving that particular cancer. The tissue of origin is still relevant because that affects the surgical options, et cetera, but this is the new standard of care. In fact, um, we have a trial going on here called the MOST trial. I think I'll put a, a yeah, slide in about this. Uh, headed by David Thomas, who's the head of the cancer division, uh, where we actually sequence um, the tumours of patients to actually work out which, are the, which drug they should be treated with. And uh, I just actually came back from Korea on Friday uh, and I heard the latest out of the US there. Um, they're getting uh, over a two-fold extension in survivability and a 20% reduction in cost by taking this approach. So here's a case of a lady against in the Australian, but um, um, where whose uh, gene is sequenced, is cancer was sequenced, we're able to identify the right drug for her, and she's responded well. Um, I probably should also mention too that in this called most trial here, uh, which is extraordinarily successful, and I think it should be the standard of care within 12 months. We've already got. Um, uh, sequencing of kids with disabilities is close to the standard of care. I talk regularly to the health department about introducing this and the British have just mandated it so what was experimental last year in terms of genome sequencing of kids with disabilities is now standard of care in Britain and will be here within 12 months I hope. This uh, sequencing of tuners will be standard of care too because basically you can give the drug, identify whether the 
cancers being driven by a particular mutation will respond to a particular drug and then you put the people on the right drug. If people don't have an actual, what we call an actionable mutation, they go on to a, a double immunotherapy trial. <coughs> and David showed me the figures the other day. 60% um, of the people going into that double immunotherapy trial, and these are people who failed conventional chemotherapy and cancer, are now surviving uh, for up to, over 200 days so far and counting. There's just, and it looks like they've disease free. Uh, I was just told by email yesterday about a little girl who uh, we identified a mutation in her gli glioma in her brain cancer that had never been seen before, but it has been seen in other cancers and there was a drug available. She was put onto this drug uh, eight weeks ago and they can't find the tumour anymore. It's just gone. So, uh, and I'll tell you a story about the way science works too, about immunotherapies. I don't know if you've heard that term yet, but they're, they're, this is curing cancer. So. Uh, a large number, 20 to 40 percent of uh, lung cancers and melanomas are being cured by this approach. And totally unexpected, but um, and there's a Nobel Prize coming for it. So you may remember Christian Barnard, you know, when heart transplants were first done? Well, when people go on organ transplants, they're given immunosuppressive drugs so the body doesn't reject the new organ. And uh, What's commonly observed is that people on immunosuppressive drugs get cancer everywhere everywhere, just tumours. And when the immunosuppressive drugs are withdrawn, once the organs settled in, cancers disappear. So that really says loud and clear, we all get cancer every day, every one of us. But our immune system picks it up and knocks it off. So um, it was kind of obvious in retrospect, all good science is, but most people are fiddling around other areas, but there was a a couple of individuals, one in Australia, uh, it's now in Queensland, but the main person was in the States, who uh, beavered away on this. And they, so their, their thesis was that as we get older, the reason why we're more risk for cancer is not just because we're accumulating mutations from cosmic rays or whatever, chemicals or whatever, but also because our immune system starts to, to wear down. So they looked for the uh, the breaks on the immune system that stop the immune system from attacking our cells and worked out ways to release those breaks or at least soften them so the immune system became titchier again. And uh, they're called checkpoint inhibitors and sure enough if you give it to somebody with cancer and we still don't know why some people respond and some don't but, but those that do are cured. So basically the immune system is re-energised and the cancer is and I'll tell you one more quick story because uh, it, it, about a woman we sequenced uh, in, in Melbourne recently. Now there's, there's exceptional responders in everywhere every part of medicine, you know, and people who get conventional chemotherapy were fine for life. It's unusual, but um, it happens. Uh, in this particular case, um, it's called the abscopal response. You want to impress your friends at a Scrabble game, the abscopal <laughs> response. Uh, look it up, ab, you know, as in abdomen, scopal. Uh, but it describes a phenomenon uh, this lady was an example of where this is 15 years ago she had stage 4 metastatic melanoma she had bone metastases everywhere which is usually what kills you if you get breast cancer you don't die of breast cancer you die of bone metastases and they treated in Melbourne uh, a big tumour in her head uh, by radiation presumably to, to reduce suffering or to give her a few more months but she wasn't going to survive, you know. When you get stage four metastatic melanoma, you're, you're for it. Anyway, what happened after she had the radiation treatment was that all the cancers disappeared. Just melted away, never came back. She got Crohn's disease at the same time, which is a rare form of autoimmunity, which was the clue that she somehow had an immunological response. So the, uh, the idea was that zapping the tumour in her brain released bits of the dead cells to the circulation and a titchy immune system reacted and cleaned up the rest. So we sequenced her, because nobody knew why this happened, except it seemed vaguely immunological. We sequenced her and we've discovered a totally new pathway for curing cancer and we're patenting this at the moment. By the way, we patented it not to be avaricious, but uh, for two reasons, uh, and, we, and the government insists we do. Uh, the main reason is to guarantee that it'll get through to clinical practice because if the uh, therapy isn't patented, no drug company or anybody's going to invest the billion dollars in the phase one, two or three clinical trials to make sure it's uh, safe and effective for use. So the patenting is really a way of preserving intellectual property so that people can recover their investment. 
huge investment in developing these drugs. And of course, we'd like to use our expertise to help sustain ourselves as well. So this, uh, this is an example. The other thing, just to tell you, this is David Thomas with, with uh, his partner, Mandy Ballinger, um, who's brought a totally new approach to cancer analysis as well. Let's just give you a feeling of the sorts of things we do. Um, David's thesis is that um, people who suffer cancer at a young age or multiple cancers are inheriting cancer risk genes. Now, the reason why cancer occurs is because the genes that control our growth and development, you know, our fingers don't grow forever, or our nose, or not Pinocchio, mm -hmm. uh, are very finely controlling our cell growth and development. And when those genes are damaged, then that control is lost and you start to get a tumour, which then can grow and metastasize. So um, the genes that do this are pretty well understood. And if you inherit a damaged gene from your, one of your parents, then you've only got to get the other one damaged and you're in strife. Right? So, and you've got 50 trillion cells in your body, so you've got one dud one and you've just got to have a zap on the other one and you've got cancer. Whereas if you've got two good copies, you... And David says he, he's, he thinks he's able to predict who'll never get cancer and who's highly likely to get cancer. So using genomic information, or, and this was published recently together with the National Cancer Institute in the United States, um, predicted individuals who were highly likely to get cancer because they were suffered a what's called a germline mutation uh, in an important cancer-causing gene. And then selected the ones at high risk and gave them whole body MRIs, magnetic resonance imaging. Because, you know, with breast cancer, with BRCA, you know, the Angelina Jolie thing, the, that mutation of that gene would give you a high risk of, of all cancers, actually, but mainly breast and ovarian. But it underlies others. Uh, and there's another one called Lynch syndrome, which is colon. But all the other cancer-causing genes can give you cancer anyway, depending on where that second hit occurs. So using that information, it took 500 individuals who were uh, predicted to be at risk for cancer and gave them whole body MRIs because they didn't know where the cancer might be, high resolution. One in 10 of them had cancer they weren't aware of. And one individual had two separate cancers. Now, the great thing about this is that that's early enough to surgically resect. This is pre-symptomatic. By the time cancer, particularly ovarian, that's a bad one because you don't have the symptoms of ovarian cancer until it's very advanced and your chances of getting out of jail are limited. But if I say, look good, but uh, you're at high risk for cancer, don't worry. I know you're going to, but mm. try not to. I, I want you to turn up every year for a whole body MRI. We'll pick it up early, we'll nip it out, and you'll be fine. You know, it's a lot better than being carted in a hospital late stage cancer and everybody's trying to figure out what to do. So, so the whole genome information is going to be used in whole life care. And I cannot, nobody disputes this. Imagine a situation in 20 years time where you go and see your physician that that individual will not pull down your genome and say, look, you know, um, you've actually got an elevated risk for cardiovascular disorder, uh, you know, need a, a pacemaker or whatever. And what we'll do is knowledge of that risk will allow us to have people uh, mitigate the risk of those things or, or screen them more carefully uh, to, to head them off. So I'll, I'll just mention this one too because it's very interesting and most people don't know this, but you know, when you go to the doc and they give you a prescription, they just give you a standard dose. There's no such thing as standard dose, we're all different. And um, about 7.6%, that's the third paragraph here, of all the hospital admissions in this country Hospital admissions, we're not just talking about ED turn-ups or emergency department, we're talking about actual admissions are due to adverse reaction to prescription drugs. Not methamphetamines, just prescription drugs. And the reason is, think of coffee. <coughs> Some of us can have a double shot and go straight to bed and others are wired for 24 hours. The reason is we've got different repertoire of enzymes in our liver that, that clear foreign compounds. And if you're very quick at clearing it, then coffee, you know, you're fine, and if you're slow, it builds up to toxic levels, and that's what happens with pharmaceuticals. So uh, common, a common thing, it could, there's one called cabrita gel used in surgery, 40% of people clear it so quickly, you might as well not give it to them. 40% respond reasonably well, other 20% re uh, clear it so slowly they're back in hospital for a, a toxic reaction. Now, you know, and, and the fact that they tell me it's a Vincent's that they won't let the country patients go back for another 24 hours because it's easy enough to pull somebody back in from Wallara or Strathfield, but from Blaney it's a different matter. So 
That's how common it is, 100,000 deaths in the US. So, um, and a lot of drugs just don't work. Or oh, another one you take home. I reckon I've been successful in chatting to people if you go home in the evening over dinner and say, guess what I heard today, you know? The reason why jo dogs can't eat chocolate is because they can't clear it. We can, thank God. Well, praise the Lord. <laughs> so we can uh, predict and avoid most of these already. And a tremendous savings to the healthcare system as well as uh, to uh, the, you know, the individuals. And that's the value of what we do and what we're trying to achieve here. So we've set up this personal health genomics through this uh, translational company called Genome One. And uh, it uh, looks at several hundred genes and will tell you about your predispositions for cardiac disease or cancer or um, drug responses. And in fact, now, when you get to our age, shall I say, you're probably okay. <coughs> because you haven't dropped dead uh, of a cardiac arrest at 45 or... But uh, everybody's, we're finding when we do this, everybody's got some drugs they just should not take. Mm -hmm. And apparently, I, I'm smartly surprised by this, but you won't be, uh, it's a big problem for older people because as we get older, we take more and more prescriptions to deal with things like arthritis or whatever. And, and so the risk of these adverse reactions uh, goes up. And so... Uh, this pilot program uh, is just a pilot at this point, but we expect that this will be standard of care in 10 or 20 years' time, as I said, you go to the doctor. So that's what we try to achieve here, is to actually not only use knowledge of human genetics to understand human biology and disease better, but actually to make life better. And that's a deliverable. That's why people support us. And, uh, and that's why I think it's worth saying that the, the field has made tremendous progress, you know from uh, over the last century, but this, we're, we're, we're picking up speed and uh, I, I think we will be the last generation to die from cancer. I think we will be the last generation to really have serious health problems that are not anticipated and headed off at the pass. Uh, you know, I, I don't think, you know, you couldn't imagine a, a, a post-industrial world if you're sitting there in the 18th century. I think we can't imagine the post-health world that's coming up in this century once we get all of this information and start to use it. So, thank you for coming. Uh, don't, don't clap. Um, no, I'm serious. <laughs> uh, um, I want to thank you for coming. I want to thank you for being interested in supporting us. And uh, we do rely very heavily on, on people's support. And I'd like to, in my tenure as director of this institute, to leave it in a position where it has sufficient resources to be brave to support these young ones with really great ideas. The ones who can see the clues, the cracks, you know? And the conventional system doesn't support them so well. And I think, you know, this place to earn the respect and support has to be very special. But if it can be special, then it will do special things. And so, uh, you know, we, we not only exist to serve you, but, um, but we can't exist without you, basically. So, thank you. Happy to answer questions.